Thanks for joining me again, Brahmas fans. This is Troy DePew, the official, unofficial, never superficial Texas Brahmas examiner, the place for anything and everything Texas Brahmas related. Do remember to subscribe to the articles at the top of the examiner.com website. And you can follow me at Brahmins Examiner on Twitter. That's probably the easiest way. Or you can go directly to the site at www.examiner.com slash texas dash brahmins dash n dash four dash worth. I'm sitting here today with a legend in the CHL. Someone who, in my opinion, is the face of the Brahmins franchise. A true leader and a great goal scorer, Mr. Chad Woolard. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks. Now, I mentioned a legend in the CHL. But really, your name is pretty well known in just about every hockey league that's ever been, isn't it? Uh, you played in the junior level at the OHL. You played in the CHL, the old WPHL. Uh, you played a couple of games in the AHL and the old UHL and even the old IHL. And you even went to the Dallas Stars training camp before playing for the, their minor league affiliate at the time, the Utah Grizzlies. I mean, what a colorful career. Yeah, it's, you know, I've seen some great places. Like you said, I've basically played in almost every league there is to play in and you know it's it's been a journey and you know I've loved doing it and that's why I'm still playing. Now you joined the ECHL in, in uh, 1999-2000 with uh, the Jackson Bandits and then went to the Greensboro Generals next year. But Browns fans, no, we care about the 2000-2001 season when you came to the then Fort Worth Brahmas. In 60 games, you had 18 goals and 20 assi 26 assists that year, gaining you a two-game call-up to the Utah Grizzlies. Uh, you, got, you got the call-up to the AHL from the St. John's Maple Leafs in 2003-2004 for four games and scored a goal there. Then another two-game call-up to the AHL for the San Antonio Rampage in 2006-2007. Did I get all that right? Yep, that's, that's <laughs> right, yeah. Now, any true Bronx fans knows this, but uh, you currently hold six franchise records for the Purple and Black. Why don't you go ahead and boast a little bit and tell us all about what those six records are? Uh, I don't even, you know what, I, I know the one I do know is, is games played, and I think you're going to get that when you play, you know, six years with the team, and I think they got maybe goals and points, and, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, I really don't look at, but... When, when people bring them up, it, you know, it brings a smile to my face to know that I've been able to play with one team for uh, most of my career, and you know I owe a lot to this organization for you know keeping me around and wanting me to come back. And you know I I love playing here, and you know hopefully I can finish my career. Well, who wouldn't want a man back that's got the, the franchise records are games played 467. So that was actually last year, so that's gone up to. That's gone down quite a bit. Uh, you've got the, the re franchise record in points, goals, shots, game-winning goals, and power play goals. And you also hit two milestones uh, that to me sound unreachable last season, uh, 700 games and 700 points. Yeah, that was, you know, that was, it was kind of in the back of my mind at the beginning of the year, and, you know, I had some people bring it up to me from back home in Canada, you know, that was kind of a big milestone, and you know, a sense of longevity to be able to play the game that long. And, you know, the way things were going last year, our line was clicking, and it almost just snuck up on me that I was getting that close to be able to get the 700 games and 700 points really close to each other. And, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, we were playing really well at that time, and it was almost I wasn't thinking about it, so it came, and, you know, before I knew it, I had it. And, you know, it was really nice what the Brahmins organization did for me, and, you know, it was a big surprise, and I greatly appreciated it. You also scored you scored 10 hat tricks in the CHL, including one last year against the Jackalopes. Have any fans complained about running out of hats to throw on the ice? No, you know, they haven't, <laughs> and, you know, it's one thing that I've been fortunate enough is, you know, to get one hat trick, you know, it's a great feeling, and, you know, to be able to get 10 over my career, it's great, and, you know, every time you get one, it's just like getting the first one all over again. You know, the guys are always so happy for you. And, you know, I've been lucky enough where I'd say most of them came in games that we won, too, so that's a big part of it as well. I want to go back to the to the issue of the 700 games played. Uh, I got the CBA for the CHL, and it says that, and I quote, a veteran player shall mean a player other than a goaltender who has played in 301 or more regular season games 
of professional hockey, including NHL, AHL, CHL, ECHL, IHL, UHL, or European professional games or equivalent leagues. For the 2010-2011 season, each team shall be limited to five veterans, goaltenders exempt, plus one returning veteran from the previous season on the Cubs on the club's season-ending roster. So that means that the Brahmins can only sign five guys that have played more than 300 pro games from other teams plus one returning. Does that mean that the Brahmins cannot sign another returning veteran from last year's teams, or is, just, or is it just a kind of a funny way of saying six total veterans? Yeah, they, they could sign, if we had six returning veterans from last year, they could sign six returning veterans. It's, it's basically just a way to give the team a break on if they're bringing a veteran back from the year before to where he counts as a vet, but he doesn't count as a vet, the Got way it. the rule is written. And so basically you can bring in five other veterans from other places that didn't play the year before and have another six veteran from the year past. Okay. Now, I'd have to say that either way, it would be absolutely crazy not to have not to have used one of those to sign an eight-time 30-plus goal scorer in 12 seasons. Uh, now well, the way I look at it is that I'm the returning vet, so I'm not even going to count myself as a vet, so I'm going to tell everyone that I'm about half my age and, you know, make fun of all the other older guys. Now, if it's all right with you, I'd like to ask a couple of questions a little bit more personal regarding the CBA. Is that all right? Yeah, absolutely. Now, I know that you got a little guy, uh, Wyatt. Is that, is that yep, right? Yep, uh, He's He's... A, He's actually got the same pair of skates that one of my one of my daughters has. <laughs> I saw that. Um, looking at the CBA and the minimum pay for, and the salary cap for the team, um, it really can't be easy financially to to make sure that you got enough money to take care of him and all the other bills. Uh, with the minimum being three hundred forty-five dollars a week for rookies and three hundred ninety for anyone that's played uh, for more than twenty-six pro games. Obviously, you wouldn't be near the minimum, but the cap for the team is, and I quote yet again. During the 2011-2012 season, the salary cap will be $10,650 per week plus 50% of one exemption player. The league will have the option to go to a flat cap of $11,000 per week. Uh, that doesn't give a whole lot of room for a, a big weekly check to extend out for anyone, does it? No, it doesn't. You know, I've been I've been lucky enough over my career to where you know the team's taken care of me, and you know I think a lot of a lot of it has to go with my wife has had a job the whole time that that I've been playing, and you know without her I probably I probably wouldn't I wouldn't be playing. You know she's made huge sacrifices to you know the five years that I played here, and then when I also when we moved away, you know she continued to work, and you know it's that's the side of it that people don't see is that you know when there's a married guy and he has a family. You know, my wife has taken on a huge responsibility to, you know, have a job and be able to let me play a game for, you know, a living right now. And now that I have a have a son, you know, it's it's become more of a reality that, you know, I got to keep making good money, or you know, there's going to be a time when you got to move on. And you know, I'm probably closer to the end than I am in the beginning, that's for sure. And you know, it's it's something you got to look at every year. But you know, I've, I'm doing okay right now, and I'm gonna keep playing, and I'm. Not that old. <laughs> no. Um, is it easier for for a, a young single guy coming in? Is it easier for him financially because he doesn't have maybe maybe have as many bills? I think, you know, I don't know if it's easier. I think the one thing, and I just from experience, is that when you're younger, you're not thinking about the money. Absolutely. You could be making, you know, two hundred bucks a week. You could be making fifty grand a week. I think it's. At the beginning, the first few years, you know, you're playing for the love of the game and you're playing pro hockey and everyone's looking to get to the NHL and to be able to show up every week and, you know, we maybe work, you know, 20 hours a week, if that, and if you want to call it work, we're playing a game. And to be able to get a paycheck every week to, to do something you love, I really don't think that anyone looks at it or plays the game for money. And, you know, obviously when you get older and you have a family, money becomes more prevalent and you know you got to look at those things and you know I'm still looking at it that I'm I'm getting a paycheck every week to live in a place where I have a house and call home and you know still play a game that I love. Absolutely and, and we respect we re definitely respect that about every player that's playing in the CHL they're playing for the love of the game that is absolutely true. Uh, on the lighter topics 
Uh, I asked this question of Rulo, and his answer was, without hesitation, you. So I want to know, who would you pick? If you were GM for a day and had to pick just one guy from last year's team to bring back to this, onto this team, yourself excluded, uh, who would it be and why? Uh, well, to be honest, one player that I would love to have back, and obviously he's not coming back, is Greg Huggaboom. I mean, he was, I think, by far the best player that I ever played with, and he was a great teammate. And you know, we we had some chemistry last year that I've never had with anyone over the years that I've played, and. You know, obviously everyone knows he's not coming back, and you know he wanted to go to Europe and yeah. and play another year. And you know he's got other things on his plate. You know I tried to coax him into coming back a little bit, and on the other side he tried to get me to you know to go to Europe with him as well. And you know we're really going to miss a guy like that, like on the ice obviously, but in the locker room and off the ice he was a great guy. And you know if I could get one guy to come back and he come back, that's definitely. Yeah, I got another question here. Uh, in your own words, how would you exp and being that you played in all the different leagues, how would you explain the difference in technique and position as you move up from say high school to the juniors, the juniors or college, and up through the different professional leagues with the skill level increasing and the tempo increasing, and as Rulo <laughs> pointed out, the size increasing as well. Well, I think you know the the tempo of the game and the pace of the game from when I started to now is, you know, it's night and day. I don't think the hockey was as good, you know, 12 years ago when I started. There was way more teams, there was more leagues, and I think now, basically with the CHL and the East Coast League, there's no difference in the play. You have guys that think that play the East Coast League, well, I'm going to go to the CHL and I'm going to tear it up. And year after year, you see guys come over and, you know, they... They do okay, but they don't, they don't tear it up. It's I think the only difference is, is the CHL is an older league due right. to the fact that we can have more veterans and the veteran rule is higher and the fact that more East Coast League teams are affiliated where their teams are filled with 22, 23, 24-year-olds. But, I mean, there's no difference in the style of play. Like, you've seen guys come over from, from leagues, and, you know, we had a couple last year with, you know, Chris, Chuck, and Mick, and... You know, I think they got their eyes opened up too. It wasn't as easy as guys think it's going to be. Like, there's not as many teams as there used to be, and it's just the fact that you know there's there's no weak teams anymore. You saw in our league last year, every right. team's good, and you know I, the comparison is basically equal. Now, I got into a, a conversation with a very knowledgeable coach. His name, his name, he goes by Coach Chick. Um, we had a conversation about the the right-hander shooting left and left-hander shooting right, and I know I've heard that a lot of us Southerners are a little bit backwards because uh, a lot of us do the right-hander shoot with a right-handed stick. The Canadians, from what I hear, are always right-handers shoot with the left-handed stick to get that extra whip from the dominant hand. Personally, I'm a righty and I shoot with the right stick to have to have my dominant hand down low for more control. You shoot left. Are you a left-hander or a right-hander? Uh, I'm both. I'm, both hands are, are dominant for me, but I think, I think it was more of a thing growing up back home, you know, they just handed you a stick and you you turned it whatever way you wanted to when you were young. And I think, to be honest, the reason why Southerners all shoot right is that they ask you, what hand do you write with? Yes. And. 98% of people are going to say I write with my right hand. Well, all of a sudden, everyone's going to think, well, you should shoot right-handed. Right. And, you know, that's not the case. The way we always taught at home is your parents gave you a stick. It had a straight blade. Exactly. And you you started doing it on your own, you know, and that's, you know, what I'm doing with my boy right now. He just, I don't know what hand he's going to be. Sooner or later, he'll figure it out which way is easiest for him, and that's the way they'll go. Yeah, I mean, my answer to the question was it just has to feel right. To me, it's, it's kind of like baseball. If you get a kid, if you get a kid, and don't tell him which way is right-handed, which way is left-handed, but just show him how to swing the bat both ways, he's going to really quickly tell you which way feels right and which way feels absolutely yeah, wrong. Absolutely, I mean, it's, and it's the same with, with shooting the puck. Like you're going to feel more comfortable one way in, you know, whether that's right-handed or left-handed. But I've seen a lot of kids down here where I almost honestly think that they should be shooting left-handed and they're shooting right-handed. Yes. And, but it's one of those things where, you know, that's, that's the way things go and, you know, the game's still fairly new down here, but 
you know, the game's definitely growing from 12 years ago. Definitely, definitely. It's, it's one stat that a lot of people don't quite realize is since the, I know since the early 1980s, there has actually been more minor league hockey played in the state of Texas than in all of Canada. Yeah, I mean, I think the one big thing is that it's so new that, you know, people are getting used to it and arenas are popping up all over the place. And it, it's getting more exposure now. Yeah, uh, and the big thing was the Dallas Stars winning the Stanley Cup. I mean, as soon as they won the Stanley Cup, hockey blew up and... You had the Star Centers popping up everywhere. Right, and I mean, that's, the game's grown immensely down here. Like, there's, I've never seen so many youth, youth teams playing, and I think that's great, and that's how... You know, I know the U.S. national program is trying to grow the game, and, you know, 10 years ago, you were never seeing U.S. kids, born U.S. players, being drafted in the first round of the NHL. And yeah, now, we thought that, I mean, we just we just heard Mike Madonna retire. He was one of, one of the first American-born players to get drafted first overall. Yeah, and now you're seeing more and more, and it's just, I mean, overall, just it's become a global game, like, even over in Europe. I mean, they've gotten a lot better, and it's just the balance of play is definitely equaled out. Well, that does, just about does it for time. Uh, again, I thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me. And uh, just a personal note, uh, what, one last question before we go. What was the Wooly on a Stick program that they did last year? Uh, I think it was just, what it was is they just did a little promotion with the 700 points and 700 games, and I think they handed out 700 of them. <laughs> and it was just something little they did, you know, kind of as a little joke and, you know, just to oh, get me going man. a little bit. But, you know, it, it's something I appreciated. You know, Mike, right. they're actually always thinking about good things to do up there, and, you know, they've, they've done some great things over the year, and I got a kick out of it. <laughs> All right, I appreciate it very much. Have Absolutely, a good day. No problem. Look forward Thank to seeing you. you on the ice. Hey.